Well, thank you all very much. And uh, we had hoped to have some coffee and bagels and, and, and little small treats to uh, soften you up, but our logistics is still still working it out, so it'll get here soon. Um, but listen, it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming out, and it's good to see so many familiar faces in the crowd as well. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to outline some, some opening thoughts and comments, and then just uh, happy to respond to any questions that anyone has beyond that. Um, and, you know, this is my uh, first big press conference, so I hope you guys will go easy on me. Um, as, as many of you um, know and as you've read in my bio, um, I come to the State Department with a long experience on Capitol Hill at USAID and working in the humanitarian and development community. And that brings for me a particular perspective on how I approach our foreign policy and diplomacy um, in the South and Central Asia region at this very important time. Because fundamentally what I've learned through my career is you really can't talk about national security without talking about human security. And you really can't focus on our foreign policy and diplomatic engagement um, through just government to government channels that your foreign policy um, and your engagement also needs to speak to the hopes and the aspirations of the people of the region. And that's what I bring is that fundamental belief my, one of my favorite quotes, um, and I saw it when I was in DACA just a couple of, minute, a couple of uh, weeks ago, is a quote from Senator Edward M. Kennedy that's on the, on the EMK Center in DACA, and that is that our relationship is not just government to government, but it's people to people, citizen to citizen, and friend to friend. And I hope that in my tenure that I can underscore that. Um, this, is, this is a region of extraordinary geographic, linguistic, cultural diversity, extraordinary beauty, and incredibly vibrant societies. But it's also a region that's facing uh, great challenges and in the middle of very important transitions. So while many see these transitions as a source of anxiety or uncertainty, I actually see them as a source of opportunity. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit, is, is the opportunities that I see ahead of us. Um, in the past year alone, five countries in the region have undergone national elections. Uh, Maldives, Tajikistan, Nepal, Bhutan, and Pakistan. And certainly in some of these elections in Nepal and in Pakistan, these have been historic um, uh, and, and consolidations of, of strong democratic uh, traditions and gains. And we work with these countries on strengthening their democratic institutions in seeking greater political participation and recognizing the progress that has been made. We also have three big political transitions that lie ahead in Bangladesh, in India, and in Afghanistan. And since I just came from Dhaka, let me just uh, start there to say that while we while we really welcome the announcement of um, elections on January 5th, we do think that there is an urgent call for concerted efforts at dialogue to bring the two major political parties closer together. Uh, that had been my message and my emphasis during my trip, and that continues to be our call today. Uh, we also call on all sides to restrain uh, violence. Violence has no place in the democratic process, and we think it's very important that all sides find ways to move forward to have free, fair, credible, and peaceful or violence-free elections in Bangladesh. In India, you know, voters have demonstrated time again in this world's largest democracy, a uh, robust and resilient um, democracy. And it's an impressive process to watch unfold as hundreds of millions of people go to the polls in a peaceful manner. And so we look forward to the Indian elections, um, and we look forward to watching that process unfold. Uh, we've also worked closely with India to learn some of the lessons of its 
um, uh, democratic process and its election process to see how um, particularly the technical capabilities that India has built up can benefit other countries as well. And the United States looks forward to working in close partnership with India with uh, whatever the outcome of that election process will be in terms of the next government that comes into place. Um, throughout the region, we've been working with governments and civil society to work uh, to build those political uh, transitions and to support both young democracies and more established ones. Um, we want to continue to support the efforts of inclusive and participatory political systems. We want to support the rights of ethnic minorities and religious minorities in all of these countries and marginalized communities. Um, and we continue to stress the importance of political reconciliation um, in countries that have been plagued with civil conflict, such as Sri Lanka. We'd like to see a region that is much more interconnected. And I think we have a historic opportunity with two key transitions that are underway in the region, the one in Afghanistan and the one in Myanmar. Myanmar is not under my area of responsibility, but it affects greatly the opportunities that the countries of South Asia have in terms of, for the first time, being able to see a South Asia and a Southeast Asia join together in trade and commerce. And similarly, as we see the political security and economic transition ahead for Afghanistan, there's a tremendous opportunity to see the countries of Central Asia connect in trade and commerce to the countries of South Asia. When President Obama talks about the rebalance to Asia, this is fundamentally the vision that he's talking about, the vision of an Asian landscape that is bound together in trade and commerce, a vision of an integrated trade landscape. And, you know, I, I often talk about the fact that the Asian Development Bank has put out this study um, and other studies corroborate that Asian economies have the potential in the coming decades to comprise 50 percent of global GDP. Now, that's not a probability, but that is definitely a possibility. And to make that possibility com become a reality, the countries of the region need to address challenges of inclusive growth, of improved governance, of combating corruption, of diversifying their economies, and engaging in investing in the citizens of their countries. These are all areas that the United States stands ready to work shoulder to shoulder with the countries of Asia to ensure that that vision of Asian prosperity and Asia's role in creating a shared prosperity around the globe is realized. Um, already, we're working with our partners in the region on major energy trade customs and people-to-people -people projects that support that connectivity. Uh, CASA 1000, which is creating an energy grid that brings surplus hydropower from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to meet energy needs in Afghanistan and Pakistan, is ever closer to being a reality, and we've narrowed that financing gap considerably. Um, TAPI, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India uh, pipeline, that would seek to bring Turkmen gas to um, meet the energy needs of, uh, again, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India is, again, ever closer to becoming a reality. And we look forward to working with the countries in the region to address the remaining challenges. And really, the work that we have done over the past decade in investing in road and infrastructure in Afghanistan and across the region is all about supporting that integrated landscape. Similarly, as I had noted, the political transition in Myanmar creates an enormous opportunity um, to connect India, Bangladesh, the countries of South Asia to the countries of Southeast Asia. India has already recognized that enormous potential and has already started lining up its own investments in infrastructure, in, in uh, capacity. Um, and the United States and countries of um, Asia are very interested in supporting that connectivity. So, you know, as I mentioned, 
this vision is, is one of tremendous potential. And it's a vision that is not of the U.S. making. It's a vision that's really of the region. That vision of a new Silk Road really captures what, to me, as a young girl who was born in a small town in India, who grew up with stories that my grandfather would talk about, of how the pomegranates from Afghanistan, Kabuli Anar and Chamanki Angur, were really the things that brought together countries and cultures. And that's a vision that we would like to support and see become once again the reality. Um, that's just a little bit of my hopes and aspirations. I recognize that you all probably have a lot of questions that you'd like to pursue, so why don't I stop there and turn to you. Do you want to moderate? We'll go on to questions. I just have a few things before we start. I ask that you identify yourself by your outlet and your name before you pose the question. Please also wait for the microphone as we are doing a transcript on this. Um, I see that we already have somebody in New York. Um, I will get to questions uh, in due order, so please be patient. And also, we have a finite amount of time, so I please ask you to keep your questions brief and to one part. Thank you very much. Let me start in the middle. The woman in the Sure. And, um, and also, we know that there's a delegation coming from Uzbekistan next week. Yeah. Give us some details about that. Sure. Well, let me start with saying that um, the United States has an enduring commitment to the region. We see uh, U.S. relationship with the countries of Central Asia as being um, an important um, and enduring uh, priority for the United States and that we see a Central Asia that is more interconnected as being in the interests individually and collectively of all the countries in the region. And that's what our engagement is really geared towards. And so as we look at um, the Uzbek delegation that is coming here next week led by Foreign Minister Kamilov um, for the annual bilateral consultations. We look forward to having dialogue that continues to deepen and strengthen that collaboration. It's a full-ranging dialogue and we discuss all of the areas of convergence between our two countries as well as areas of divergence and areas of concern. So we um, really appreciate that we have a fulsome dialogue with each of the countries of the region around a full range of issues and we look forward to continuing that. I'll go to the front and back to the, to the front here. Aziz Hanifa with India Abroad and Aridif. Uh, uh, Nisha, good to see you here. It's good to see you. Uh, five, uh, f five years ago, when the US India SIB nuke deal was signed, it was considered sort of the symbolic uh, manifestation of the US India strategic dialogue. Uh, today, it still remains in limbo. Uh, uh, there are people who say that the liability, nuclear liability law has indeed become a liability, and there's a lot of angst among US business and industry and even among Indian Americans who really lobbied the Hill in terms of getting that law through. Uh, some feel that India has played the US, it got what it wanted, and now there doesn't seem to be anything happening, and that the early works agreement and all that talk is only a spin. How do you uh, hope to alleviate this? Because it's still seen as sort of, uh, as I said, sort of the manifestation of the US-India strategic dialogue. And that moving ahead in terms of full implementation would probably get, would be the catalyst that probably people could talk as a strategic dialogue. Well, I think the CIVNUC um, agreement between the United States and India has been a tremendous, um, a tremendous and, and, and powerful symbol of the uh, relationship. And I don't think it's in limbo. I think we are making progress. Is it as, um, as, as fast and as full as we would like it? No, I think that there are definitely um, um, steps that we think would help move things along. But I think that the small uh, contract agreement that was uh, um, announced during Prime Minister Singh's visit was an important step 
in the right direction. And I am hopeful that that will continue to pave the way for greater steps. And I think that India has to take its own steps to see what can be done with respect to its, uh, its liability laws and with respect to the concerns that, um, that the private sector has with respect to, um, to liability. But let me just say that the nature of the relationship has so transformed that this is a very important component but it is one of very many components. We have such a fulsome range of uh, discussions and dialogue and cooperation between the United States and India. Uh, you know, right now, in fact, we have in Delhi a uh, group of uh, law enforcement officials, police commissioners from key cities in the United States that are in India for a law enforcement dialogue um, to share lessons learned, best practices, um, on a range of issues. We have an energy dialogue. We have, you know, just a broad range of science and technology cooperation, um, et cetera, education, higher education dialogue. So I think that the um, that, that emphasis on any one particular issue is probably not um, as necessary as it was in the past, but we're pushing ahead on every single front. And we're working with our Indian colleagues and counterparts on every single front, including on civil nuclear cooperation. Here, and then we'll go to New York. Thank you, Lalit Shah from Press Trust of India. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center. In the next three years of this uh, president's term, how do you see the India-U.S. strategic relationship evolving after a brief pause of the elections that India is headed towards? Yeah, first of all, I don't think we have a pause at all. I think that we're continuing to move forward um, over the next six months, and we're very much looking forward to receiving the Foreign Secretary next week. Um, and I know we have uh, energy dialogue slated for, um, for early next year. So, so like I said, I don't think that there's any pause. I think everything is moving forward um, uh, at a pace. But, uh, but I think that the relationship will continue to strengthen and deepen and grow. And I think that increasingly it's not just a bilateral relationship, but it is a regional and a global relationship. And we see, you know, as, as, as President Obama um, um, most aptly characterize it that this is a this is a partnership and a relationship that is one of the defining uh, partnerships of the 21st century and that's because it's a partnership based on shared values shared approaches and we believe that India provides an incredible example of democratic development and we want to support that example as one that more and more countries ought to follow okay we'll go to New York for this question and then back here to Washington Yes, uh, good morning, Honorable Secretary. This is Shehabuddin Kislu from BanglaNews24.com. Hi. Uh, uh, recently, you have visited Bangladesh uh, that uh, you have already mentioned, and we are expecting some high, uh, high officials, I mean the top diplomats from UN, to visit Bangladesh this week. Uh, would you kindly uh, elaborate us uh, the situation in Bangladesh that you observed at the time, and actually what is the a, a main problem uh, for the solution uh, of this uh, uh, continuing uh, political situation in Bangladesh. And mainly, uh, it is now open secret that the opposition, uh, along with uh, their ally, the Jamaat Islam, uh, through their movement, is uh, seeking uh, or expecting kind of military intervention there. If, if in a, a hypothetically, in case of that situation, what is uh, the U.S. stand? Well, um, let me just say that um, my visit to Bangladesh um, was an important one for me because I see such enormous progress and such enormous future potential um, in Bangladesh. Uh, the economic growth that Bangladesh has experienced over the past decade, um, the gains that it has made on development, on the improvements in uh, health, in maternal mortality, in child mortality, um, the drops in fertility rates, the improvements in food security. Uh, this, is, this is an incredible story of progress 
that we have seen in Bangladesh and an incredible potential for the future as we talk about this more integrated um, region between South and Southeast Asia. And the major challenge, in my opinion, that stands in the way of Bangladesh realizing that future is if there is not a political transition that is um, free, fair, smooth, and acceptable to the Bangladeshi people, we would like to see this country continue to move forward on the path towards development and prosperity. And the United States and our, our, our friends in the international community don't have a stake in who wins what election. But we would like to see a process that is free, fair, credible, and free from violence. That has been the message that we have underscored. And for that to take place, both of the major political parties need to come together. The solutions are not going to come from the international community. The solutions are there within the people and the institutions and the parties of Bangladesh. And what needs to happen is for that dialogue that allows a compromise to emerge that will allow for elections to take place that the people of Bangladesh can have confidence in and can feel are credible. And that has been our underlying message publicly and privately. Thank you. Here in the front, and then we'll go down to the back. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Raghubir Goyal from India Globe in Asia. Congratulations and Thank you. welcome. My quick two questions. One, as far as uh, uh, m uh, Mr. Modi, the, from the s chief minister from the most, uh, of course, successful state, Gujarat now, major candidate for the prime minister next year elections. Visa problem is still there, and uh, it was a major issue time to time in the Indian parliament and in the Indian pol political uh, arena. What's going on with his visa? Finally, as far as India's stand in Afghanistan is concerned, after 2014, Indian political system is worried about because of there is a triangle, Pakistan, India, and US, or among others. So I, I believe that Pakistan doesn't want India's role in the future, but India has invested billions of dollars, that's what according to the U.S. analysis and Prime, uh, President Obama. So what will the future of India in Afghanistan after 2014? Thank you. Um, so let me just um, respond to your last point first, which is that um, what India, Pakistan, and all the countries in the region want more than anything is a stable and secure Afghanistan. And that is the point of convergence for all the countries in the region. And we think that that is the point for constructive engagement with all the countries in the region. And that has been our effort and our policy. We've had a very close uh, dialogue and cooperation with India with respect to um, the transition in Afghanistan. We have a trilateral conversation between the United States, India, and Afghanistan. Um, and India has played a very important role and continues to play a very important role and has provided over two billion in economic investment, um, has provided incredible training and infrastructure and we see that as a positive role that will continue um, moving forward. Um, with respect to your second point, I would just note that um, there's been no change in U.S. rules um, or regulations with respect to its visa policy and that is that um, all individuals apply and have to go undergo a review process. And so the point at which there's an application, there will be a review process. And I can't speak to what the outcome of that process would be. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, there's no, uh, no news there. There's no change in policy there. Um, it's, it is as it has always been, which is that visa applications are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, um, I'm going to go here in the middle and then to the back. Here in the, I think on this side to the, yeah, uh, sir. This side. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we have mics on both sides. Uh, sorry. Uh, 
This is Anwar Iqbal. I work for Pakistan's Dawn newspaper. Hi. And welcome here. Uh, I will also sort of go back to what you said about 2014, the transition in Afghanistan, yeah. and is an important transition, as you said. Uh, what we experienced during the first transition, which happened after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, was a complete and a rapid withdrawal of U.S. and its interest from that region, and that led to what happened in 2000 on 9/11. So there are people in that region who still fear that, if not now, further down the road, the, Mar the Americans can actually withdraw the way they did then. So can you, would you like to allay those fears? And also, one of the irritants in relationship with Pakistan is your drone policy, uh, which is people still are unable to understand. I mean, uh, do the Pakistanis approve the strikes? Do they not? Uh, I mean, are you working with them? What is the future of the, your drone policy? So could you please like to comment on these? Well, thank you for both of those questions. Um, let me just first clarify that while I am the Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, we continue to have um, Afghanistan and Pakistan policy under the direction of U.S. Special Representative Jim Dobbins. And so for specific questions with respect to um, the drone policy and such, I would refer you to Ambassador Dobbins. Um, with respect to the transition in Afghanistan, let me just say that I think that um, the United States engagement to the region, as I noted at the outset, is an enduring one. Um, and we will continue to support the economic development and prosperity of this region. Um, we're not going away. We're not going anywhere. Um, I think that we have continued to provide development assistance, economic assistance, uh, and technical support to all of the countries of the region, and we are committed to that um, as we move forward. Uh, take a um, question in the back, then I'm going to come up here to the middle. Thank you. Chidu Rajgata, The Times of India. Hi, Madam Secretary, uh, uh, y y you mentioned that, uh, you said that the U.S. looks forward to working with India, uh, whatever the outcome of the next election. So I want to go back to the visa issue uh, from Mr. Modi. Uh, does, does elected, do elected representatives and elected prime minister, uh, are they subject to the same rules as, say, leaders of opposition or unelected uh, people? Uh, I guess my question is, if Mr. Modi is elected prime minister, do the same visa rules apply to him? So, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of consular affairs because I, I am probably not the one that can go chapter and verse. But my understanding is that we have diplomatic visas, A1 visas, for government officials who are on official business, who are um, members of the national government. And that there are, for all other individuals, um, the normal process is a tourist visa, and that goes through the individual application process. And so, you know, depending on the official and the capacity um, in which they're visiting, the determination is made on what kind of visa they're applying for. I don't know. I, I don't think I, so. Beyond that, I would probably have to refer you to the consular affairs folks to get more into the weeds. In the blue shirt. In the blue shirt. No. <laughs> Matthew Pennington from Associated Press. Hi, Can I ask you about um, Sri Lanka? Yeah. Um, during the Commonwealth uh, Heads of Government um, Summit recently. The British Prime Minister um, effectively sort of set a deadline saying that he wanted to see progress on um, accountability issues uh, of uh, alleged war crimes by March, or he would um, seek a UN backed um, commission of inquiry or something of that nature. Does the US um, support that position, and, and do you think it's appropriate to, to set uh, a deadline like that? Um, you know, the United States um, and, and really all of our friends uh, across the international community have underscored um, the need for Sri Lanka to um, make progress on issues of reconciliation, on issues of accountability, and on issues of uh, human rights ongoing um, concerns about the political space and human rights in the country. 
And we are committed to working with our friends in Sri Lanka to see that progress. Um, we, um, you know, we, we would like to see Sri Lanka address these issues through its own processes. And we hope that that can, in fact, be the case. I think that the patience of the international community, if real progress is not seen, particularly on issues of accountability, um, that patience will, will start to wear thin. And, and so we urge our friends in Sri Lanka to use the opportunity to show some concrete steps that their own you know, um, processes have yielded. Through the LLRC, there are a set of recommendations. I think that those are, those are exactly um, the points that we'd like to see progress on, and we'd encourage them to do that. Okay, we're going to go back to the fourth row end, and then we'll come up front here. Uh, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Ali Imran, representing Associated Press of Pakistan. Hi. Hi. Uh, you have talked uh, eloquently about uh, regional connectivity yeah. and uh, Silk Road uh, initiative. Uh, one important factor is improvement in Pakistan-India relations Absolutely. towards that end. Uh, can you tell us uh, what the U.S. is doing and what uh, the U.S. can do to help the two countries improve their relations and uh, resolve some of the long-standing disputes, including Kashmir, which lies at the heart of tensions between the two region, uh, countries, and uh, also revive their stalled peace process. Thank you. Well, let me just start by saying that there's not been any change in the long-held U.S. policy that, with respect to relations between India and Pakistan, and particularly with respect to issues uh, regarding Kashmir, that it is for India Pakistan um, to set the pace, the scope, um, and and really um, the nature of those conversations and that process. Um, the United States uh, supports any improvements in the overall relationship, and we have seen um, important overtures by both countries towards dialogue. We welcomed the fact that Prime Minister Sharif uh, and Prime Minister Singh uh, had a meeting in New York uh, last fall, and we, we welcome all uh, dialogue and all improvements in that relationship. Frankly, let me say that um, a good place to start is on the trade front because it's a win-win for both countries. Um, I think cross-border trade right now between India and Pakistan is somewhere in the range of $2.5 billion. Um, but both sides have seen the potential for that to grow to $10 billion easily. And that requires both sides to really um, come together around these sets of issues. So anything that will encourage cross-border trade will benefit both countries and really will benefit the entire region and will unleash tremendous economic potential. So uh, trade and energy are areas where we think that, uh, that there is tremendous potential and we'd love to see more progress. I think we have time for just one more question at this point and we'll go here to the... Uh, Yusuf Babonli, Azerbaijani State Telegraph Agency. You know, I uh, lived in Baku for a little while. Good, yeah, I read that. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, uh, Azerbaijan. As you know, it's, an, it's often cited as an emerging uh, uh, energy security contributor to Europe and uh, through uh, Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, what are your hopes for uh, the Trans-Caspian pipeline, gas pipeline ever realizing uh, on the scale uh, of one to ten, ten being highest, and what should the administration do to increase its support for uh, this project? Thank you. Um, you know, um, we're we're very supportive of all efforts to um, broaden and strengthen the energy connectivity and the energy grid across the region. And while I don't really have a a, a specific response for you, I'm happy to. Um, as I get further into my brief, quite honestly, I'm happy to, um, to engage with you more on that. But let me just say I think that there's tremendous, tremendous benefit to the entire region to strengthen the connectivity and the grids um, for bringing energy-rich countries into greater uh, connectivity with those countries that are looking for um, um, more sources of, of energy for their, 
for their economies. So um, I'd like to see that um, move forward. But honestly, I'll have to get back to you on the specifics.